logistical reminders. Um, we should be starting out today with um, our colleague Amelia really grounding us in what this moment means. But I do know she was having some connection difficulties, so we'll see in just a few moments whether she's able to give us that framework or whether some of the other speakers will be stepping up. Then I'll be talking to you a lot about why the GCF replenishment matters, really getting into the, the title of this webinar. Um, Leon Shalatek will be then providing the information on how the GCF replenishment actually works so that you can get into those details. And then Titia Casa will be making the case for the, the vision that we have for the GCF, the potential that we see in the GCF. So even though it's imperfect, um, what we're going to continue advocating for as we also advocate for a strong replenishment. We'll have plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. So a few more logistical reminders. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, um, share your name, your organization, or your affiliation, and we'd love to know where you're dialing in from. Um, we are recording this session, and we are going to share the recording and the slides with everyone who registered after the session concludes. Um, and as you come up with questions, because sometimes this is a very technical topic, go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll try and note those. Um, but we might wait until the end to in the question and answer session in order to discuss them. We do have logistical support today. So if you have technical difficulties, um, write that in the chat and we'll try and have someone assist you so that you can fully participate in this webinar. So first, um, we had hoped that Amelia would be here to help us understand the big picture. I know she was having some trouble connecting uh, earlier. Amelia, are you here now? All right. Um, Amelia provides an amazing geopolitical analysis of, of understanding the, the key dynamics that are driving our financial system. So even though she's not here, um, our colleague um, Liana Shalatek is actually going to step in and, and speak to some of the slides that Amelia was able to share with us. Liana? Can you share the slides, please? Screen share the slides. Oh, are the, the slides are not being shown at the moment for anyone? I, I can't see them, I'm sorry. I apologize. This entire time I have been going through um, and that has not been happening. I We might repeat a few slides just because I want y'all to be able to, to see the content. Um, just one moment. So as we go back, um, just uh, here's the reminder of the interpretation information written down, especially if you're just joining us. The agenda information we just reviewed, um, reminder of the logistics and that this session will be recorded. And then um, unfortunately, since Amelia is not able to join us at the moment, um, Liana will be speaking to her slides and, and giving us an introduction right now. Um, before we dive into the GCF of thinking about our economic and financial system in the context of climate. Go ahead, Liana. Thank you so much, Tara, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening to everybody who is on, on uh, the call today or on the webinar today. We are excited to have you. Um, admittedly, I'm a very poor substitute for Emilia, um, but I think it's important that as we are starting out, we are really crowning it as Emilia would have done um, in uh, some of the questions in the context of the larger picture. Um, and um, it's very clear, um, and you see the points that are written out here on the slide, um, that we are obviously um, talking about the context of the replenishment of the Green Climate Fund at a time of planetary crisis. Um, we are observing a system that doesn't work for people and goes beyond planetary boundaries um, at the core of the problem is our economic and financial system. So um, obviously it's not enough while important um, to think about uh, uh, getting sufficient climate finance. It's actually really a question of questioning and reforming the entire existing economic and financial system in which global north com countries composed of just 16 
percent of the population are responsible for 92% of excess global CO2 emissions and 74% of the overshoot of material resource use in the world. Um, and um, we know that almost half of it is extracted in the Global South for Global North consumption and use. And again, it's very important to put that into the broader context. We are not, um, uh, we are talking about the poly crisis. We are talking about um, the poverty crisis and uh, the indebtedness crisis going on at the same time as we are reaching um, uh, planetary boundaries uh, with respect to CO2 emissions, but also in terms of biodiversity loss. And this, of course, is a result of the economic and financial system that is perpetuating an economic growth model, um, which is based on co colonial dynamics of extraction um, that are the drivers behind the system. The next slide. So on the global financial architecture, um, uh, you might recall that we just saw the sixth assessment report of the um, IPCC, which um, uh, does not mind um, language. It really warns us of uh, the risk uh, that uh, if you're not uh, really within the next, actually within this decade, radically transforming um, our systems of consumption uh, extraction uh, and actually um, uh, other systems like the trade system and the overall financial system that we are risking uh, a temperature increase of 3.2 degrees. Um, but unfortunately the IPCC, which obviously is tasked to look par particularly or exclusively on, uh, on, the, on the climate change uh, context, never really mentions or assesses the role of the larger economic crisis or even the existence of the financial sector. And this is uh, part of the, of, the, of the bigger problem of them just having given the mandate to scientifically assess um, the, the, the climate change and, and the, the, the failings within um, uh, the, the efforts to mitigate, adapt, and um, now already facing um, massive uh, loss and damage. We know that the Paris uh, Agreement. Hi, Leanne, I'm here already. Oh, perfect. No, <laughs> thank then, you then so that's much. Wonderful. Dear. And I appreciate. Please take over. Thank you so much. Uh, well, if you can explain to me what we're doing, <laughs> we need to go through the slides. Uh, sure. Um, uh, since we weren't quite sure that. Uh, that that you would be able um, to 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 come. We were basically just trying to give the larger framing and started out um, explaining some of the slides um, that you were going to present. So we are oh, basically so just much. now in the context of the global financial architecture. Um, so if you wanted um, to to take over, please do. Uh, yeah, uh, let me turn off my video. So that we make sure everything is all right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be here doing the framing. I think it's just two two um, slides. So I'm gonna be talking about the issue on the larger um, dimensions like trade, justice, debt, tax, uh, but within the the larger framing up for degrowth and sectoral shifts, etc. And discussing a bit the discussions in relation to the to the new NFCCC. Uh, processes like the new collect new new collective and quantified goal uh, as well as the the mandate on increasing the 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 climate action and finance um but I don't know if you want me to go through the slides or more we need to go through the other panelists as well so yeah. we're on your second slide here um Liana was able to present your first slide on looking at the bigger picture of our economic system. So yeah, if you want to continue providing this framing as we as we think about um, these dynamics and injustices, and then that'll set us up for the other speakers. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so just wanted to finish with this to say that uh, even though the IPCC was on the risk of 3.2 degrees, uh, uh, it has been very clear uh, to us that the PCC experts are saying that there is not an assessment of economic crisis, uh, which is insane given that we were currently in the pandemic now. 
and uh, but also the existence of the financial sector. So whatever actions we are countries are doing in introducing the the activity of the fossil fuels at the national level, we know that the financial sector is pouring trillions into the fossil fuels industries uh, every year. So this is really uh, problematic because the IPCC is leading us into the guiding of the policy uh, framework that is needed, and yet um, it is. Uh, the, the role of the financial sector is not contemplated. So whatever the, the public field is doing, meaning governments, uh, we still have a huge task in regulating the financial sector. And this is something that is really problematic. So in, in other elements, uh, we know that the Paris commitments are inadequate, not only because it, it also, it, it fails to mention fossil fuels industries, but also because um, many points of entry are, are left outside, such as for instance, the human rights uh, dimension, but also we know that the NDCs are falling short. I just wanted to highlight here how the Green New Deals uh, in the Global North um, are expected to unleash a massive mining extraction in the South, uh, especially uh, there are expectations that are saying that it will take nine planets by 2050 to keep on extracting all of the mining that is expected to deliver for the global north consumption. So this is why we really need to, to bear into consideration to shift uh, an economic system and not only, not only rely on on, on the greening of our economy. So this is why uh, I also wanted to remind people that the nine planetary boundaries are, uh, are important to, to bear into consideration because it's not only climate change, but also uh, the other mainstreaming uh, planetary boundaries that is important is biodiversity. So if we keep on, on this trend on just delivering on the Green New Deals in the Global North, we will have a terrible impact in biodiversity and so serious that the global collapse will fall just to keep on trying to deliver the four solutions that are being expected under the UNFCCC framework. And this is why the discussion on trade justice is so important to cap mining extraction and to try to shift uh, um, the economic system and, uh, that is relied on exponential extraction. So uh, it's also really important to mention uh, that none of the fulfilling of the, of the commitments will be achieved if we don't try to degrow the wealthy, degrow the economics in the developed countries, degrow for the wealthy in the global north and global south, but also degrow those sectors that are harmful for uh, the economy, such as, yes, uh, not only fossil fuels, but also others, um, including uh, the use of the jets or the fast uh, in clothing industry, etc. And we also need specific finance and technology, but as I was mentioning already in the previous slide, we actually need to mainstream environmental and finance uh, action into all of the financial architecture um, as a whole because not only we have the problem of climate, but also all of the environmental challenges such as social acidification, mm, uh, pollution, uh, waste management, et cetera. And we also need in the dynamics of technology, not only aim to transfer, but really challenge international uh, intellectual property rights because there is still a colonial domination from the global north to the south in terms of accessing property, intellectual property rights uh, in relation to technology. So this will mean that even all of the climate finance action uh, will, will be uh, exploiting governments in the south. So this is why it's so important to really tackle systemic dynamics. And so therefore, uh, we, we say that even though there is a need for, for, for general um, attendance into finance uh, dimension, there is also a need for specific finance into the global um, action for climate action. And this is where we know that finance is falling short. And uh, despite that environmental and climate finance is an obligation, uh, if there is not enough to fulfill what is expected 
uh, for, for the urgency that is needed. So there is a discussion now, for instance, on the, in which we have a, a new collective and quantifiable goal on, on climate action. But there are a lot of uh, debate on how this is going to be delivered, for, for instance, and developed countries again insist on many tools that are uh, called, that are uh, full solutions, such as um, uh, the discussion on loans and uh, the bonds, all of those bonds are uh, debt instruments. But we know already that 70% of the climate finance already is. Uh, in terms of, of debt. So we really need to uh, discuss in a broader framework about debt, debt justice, uh, including that justice because, because of all of the flows that are going from the global south to the global north in terms of illicit financial flows. Estimate, estimate says that 8 trillion went to the south uh, towards the global north on illicit financial flows uh, in the past five years. So there is the money. There is no such a thing as the financial gap. The money is there. It just needs to be, um, we need to be aware of where is it coming from. And this is why we're saying that uh, we really need to shift um, the economic dynamic. And one thing that is really important to me is to cap extraction and add a fee to the, the extraction so that there is a cap of extraction of the mining elements, etc. of course, uh, fossil fuels, but also in the case of the mining of the rare materials that are needed for the green transition, there needs to be a fee for polluter pays so that eventually we go low and low and we remain within the planetary boundaries. Uh, next one. Yeah, Amelia, I'm so you want me to go that, back to your first slide? <laughs> yes, I'm so sorry. I really uh, I had a problem with my internet before. So apologies for being late. I just wanted to say that for, for me, it's really important to highlight the relevance of when we're talking about climate finance, that we're not talking about ODA, official development assistance. We're not talking about uh, a handful of, of billions. Um, we need to recognize that the all, all of the money in the world is not going to be enough to refrain the devastation that our planet is suffering. So we really need to shift the system because our current system doesn't work for people and goes beyond planetary boundaries. The current nine planetary boundaries that are out there that are, you know, like maintaining the balance of the planet, there are nine and human activity has already overshoot six of them. So we are really in a very dire moment. And I also want to urge uh, our audience to not only focus on climate change, but also see the bigger picture of the environmental agenda and try to see where all of these agendas are interconnected. This to me is very crucial because as we have heard in the second slide that I said that the actions that are aimed at in this, in the, for the climate change, meaning the, the Green New Deals, are actually going to be uh, destroying the, the other uh, element, which is biodiversity integrity. So the pulling all of the planetary boundaries is key, and we need to keep uh, all of them within a, a framework of that is in a safe, um, safe limit. So yeah, going back to the first slide, please. I'm sorry, just wanted to really make a a case that we cannot just see climate change in isolation. And many of the proposals that we hear uh, from our global North colleagues, especially, that keep on talking about transition to, to clean energy, to um, uh, further connectivity, uh, and transitioning to clean automotive industries, et cetera. All of those are coming with a higher um, mining demand, and that is going to happen in the global South. And that is an, uh, um, a trend that we are seeing now and is going to escalate massively in the next years. So it is really concerning to us to hear calls for uh, global green new deals without bearing in mind the current uh, trade and extraction dynamics globally. And as it stated here already, that uh, there is this there is this issue of um, 
of global justice in which we cannot keep on reproducing colonial injustices. The global north is responsible for the situation that is happening here, the destruction of the planet as a whole, not only responsible for, for the climate change, but also responsible for the, for the destruction of the entire biodiversity in the world, as uh, it has been mentioned already in this in the statistics. And it's actually uh, not generalize the destruction of biodiversity is extremely focused on the destruction of biodiversity in the global south and it's merely for the cons consumption and use in the global north so we need to stop aiming at generalizing solutions and we need to start targeting uh, common but differentiated responsibilities as well as polluter based principles and we need to demand uh, climate justice so this is why I wanted to highlight that we cannot just focus on issue on finance and asking for more money because the money is actually, uh, as I have been saying over and over, the discussion on the Green Climate Fund so far has been talking about peanuts about in, in relation to all of the money that is out there that is really generating all of the problems. So uh, in, in the past, uh, the discussion of the Green Climate Fund was uh, extremely problematic in terms of keep on demanding uh, uh, funding that was only remaining in the ODA with all, with all of the lack of, of uh, fulfillment of the commitments of developed countries. But now we are in a new stage in which we are able to see not only within the mandate of the UNFCCC, but also beyond what is the role of the of the um, international financial institutions, but also the role of other um, informal spaces uh, of, of colonial uh, impact, such as the G7, the G20, the OECD, that are now supposedly having a, a mandate on, on, on climate finance, but they keep on reproducing the, the same dynamics of, of exploitation on economic growth. That economic growth, and let me just say that is really problematic because betting on economic growth means going towards economic growth. It means exponential economic growth. is It's an insane escalation of accumulation of wealth, but this comes with accumulation and extraction in an exponential manner of uh, um, yeah, of extraction, of oppression, of inequalities. So this is why we need to, ch to challenge the framing of economic growth, but also the colonial dynamics that are coming uh, within this system. So just wanted to highlight that we cannot keep on discussing climate finance in, in isolation without seeing what is the, the what are the bigger role of the of the global economy and how we need to tackle all of those. We cannot keep on reducing our discussion in the UNFCCC, but also we need to make use of the strength that we have within the UNFCCC, such as the framework of the CBDR. And of course, that we already have a mandate for the Green Climate Fund that is a targeted fund that is really important in the, in the global uh, financial tools that we have globally, like an entity. And, and therefore we need to make the, the best out of that so that it can also start pulling. The, the Paris Agreement is also mandated to be mainstream. So seeing all of the virtual connections, but also trying to be ambitious is what I think will lead us to, to the best uh, of the situation. Thank you so much. And I apologize for my internet problems um, before to start. Uh, the session. And thank you so much, Leanne, for your opinion. <laughs> thank you so much, Amelia. Um, I, I know we've all had our internet troubles overall, and that was a wonderful segue. We're going to launch a poll right now before I start diving into some specifics around the GCF, because um, Amelia provided that, that grounding and us understanding the limitations of the GCF, and yet it's still an important vehicle and mechanism, and we want to talk about that. So before we do, we'd love to know more about this audience. What's your engagement with the GCF? Are you highly engaged? Um, do you follow the GCF when you can? Are you interested, but you don't have the capacity um, to follow right now? Are you brand new because this is still a webinar for you? And then have, has your engagement varied over time uh, according to your capacity, your resources, what organization you may be working with? I think this is also a great time. We're gonna leave this open for about 30 more seconds to remind everyone that uh, there are French and Spanish versions of the slides. And so for example, the question here has been translated on those French and Spanish versions of the slides which have been posted into the chat. 
Um, so unfortunately, we do not have an Arabic version of the slides, but we are still offering Arabic interpretation on the Korean channel. All right, we're going to close this poll in about five seconds. So final clicks. Thank you all so much. And I'm sharing the results with you so that we can get a sense of everyone here. And, and frankly, the biggest category is folks that are interested in the GCF, um, but that you, you currently don't follow. Um, sorry, that's the second biggest category. The biggest category is folks that are new to the GCF. So we're going to, to spend the next few minutes talking about the GCF generally, and then introducing you to replenishment. So this is my section, and I'm a senior program manager at Redo. Also, like the next two speakers, uh, Liana Shalatek, who you've already heard from some, um, and Titi Akosa, I'm an alternate active observer to the Green Climate Fund for Civil Society, um, because Civil Society has a structured voice at, at the Green Climate Fund, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. So let's talk about this question of, of why we should care about the the Green Climate Fund replenishment as feminists. And, and first we wanna recognize that the Green Climate Fund is the largest multilateral climate fund. And it has a really rich history, uh, but for our purposes today, it's important to note how it emerged and when it emerged at a, at a really critical point in the UNFCCC negotiations, emerging as an idea in 2009, actually coming into the text in 2010, uh, in recognition of the climate finance obligation uh, that global North countries have. Um, and, and this speaks to a lot of the dynamics that Amelia was just diving into, um, but it also speaks to the potential um, of a new and different way of doing things because during those years of design, before that first project was approved in 2015, um, during those years of technical work, so much input by civil society, um, there was a vision that the, the GCF could potentially do things differently. That's a vision that we still want to advocate for. Um, and I will be highlighting some things that the GCF does do differently and some things that we think that it can be uh, much better on as well. TT will also be going into that as we think about our advocacy for replenishment, complemented by our advocacy for a stronger uh, GCF that's really grounded in human rights and gender equality. So what is replenishment? We keep saying this word and it's important to just recognize what this process is. This is the process that funds the Green Climate Fund. This is when the funds are mobilized. And the way that that's done is through contributors making pledges. So replenishment that was kicked off last year and is happening this year. And this is the only process that funds the GCF. The Adaptation Fund, for example, um, gets a share of proceeds in addition to contributors. Um, but this is the only process through which the GCF gets any funds. And right now it plans how many projects um, and how, how much that it can support and projects and programs over the next four years based on what happens during this replenishment year. Um, and replenishment only happens every four years. And we wanna say that based on the history thus far, that there haven't been uh, contributions that have been really substantive made outside of the replenishment year, but it is still possible um, for contributors to, to give funds to the GCF at any time. They're not limited to this year where we have the big pledging conference. So let's think about this broader context of feminist climate finance. And, and, and I urge you to think about it in the context of some of the information Amelia just presented. So uh, I like to think about how quantity matters. We know that we need a bigger financial pie. Um, we know that we just do not have the quantity of climate finance and we do not have the direction of climate finance flows right now that we should in order to, to fully address the climate crisis. And so that's one reason why replenishment is really central because this is a moment where we're really talking about how big the fund is. Um, but there's, it's also a moment to talk about quality because there are some decisions that are being made now, such as whether contributions are being made in the form of grants or loans that do matter to, to the quality of finance. 
And it's also just an opportunity as well to have these discussions about quality and to try and steer the direction of the fund. And Liana will be talking more about some of how that can happen through the replenishment process um, after I conclude my next few slides. When we think about this question of replenishment, we want to also talk about the GCS replenishment. So we could talk about in the previous slide, the size of the pie for any climate finance mechanism, but let's talk about the GCF, particularly within the context of the UNFCCC. Um, and so not only is the GCF the biggest climate fund, it's the one that's tied, the biggest one that's tied to the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement, and therefore can speak to countries' plannings and policies in alignment with their commitments to the UNFCCC and Paris. We know that in this particular moment as well, that there are a lot of implications of this replenishment process um, for, for other conversations that we're having. This is a question of how much we appreciate, invest, um, and steer finance towards multilateral climate finance as opposed to other forms of finance, um, private, bilateral, philanthropic. Um, and as well, we know right now that there's conversations that are forming the loss and damage fund. And as that is happening and as that consideration of what a multilateral fund uh, could and should function like, I, we know that the GCF is providing a rich history that will be informing that conversation. There's also these ongoing conversations of the NCQG, which Amelia introduced, the new collective quantified goal. And we know that there is going to be a connection between the amount of this goal and the quality of this goal, and ultimately um, the, <laughs> the way in which this funding is flowing and how it is delivered. We know that last, uh, last time there was really a conflation between this idea of the floor of $100, million, $100 billion a year flowing to climate finance and the idea of what the GCF's capacity should be. So we know that that, that will continue to be a conversation of how, how much of these funds should be throwing through the GCF as we set a much higher and more ambitious NCQG. Also, as we think about this history, it's important in general to think about the years that it took to form the, the GCF and from that moment where it really emerged in the climate negotiations. Um, this process has had so much investment um, by Voices for Climate Justice. And so what are the implications um, of this long-term process as we think about right now um, some other long-term processes that we are very much in the middle of, thinking about the five and 10-year um, timelines for the nationally determined contributions, thinking about the fact that we're in a three-year discussion process for the new collective quantified goal that will be set only in 2025 and then exist um, for a number of years thereafter, thinking about you know, the long-term strategies um, for low emission development, how those timelines, um, which are extending to 2050, are being invested in now. How can we ensure accountability for these promises and for these commitments that are being made now, recognizing the, the promise and the potential in the GCF when it was first formed and first um, capitalized? So particularly, we as feminist civil society want to highlight and strengthen certain elements of the GCF. Um, and to talk about them is really important to climate finance. So if we are able to get the strong and ambitious replenishment that we envision, that this can help us better support these process elements, um, not only within the GCF, but within the broader climate finance architecture. So let's talk about what some of these key elements are. Um, so first and foremost, we have the governance arrangements. So thinking about this understanding of the shared governance between uh, developed and de developing countries where there's an equal voice and equal vote on the board, and that we do have uh, a very specific role of civil society observers um, with self-elected active observers that can speak at the discretion of the board co-chairs. 
there is a country ownership approach that's really highlighted within the GCF that should be focusing on country needs, uh, supporting um, the implementation of these UNFCCC linked plans, such as NDCs and national adaptation plans. Um, but we do recognize that we are really calling on the GCF to be more inclusive and expans expansive in its understanding and of country ownership and how it's operationalizing that. The GCF has direct access. Now, what that means in climate finance lingo is not that anyone can directly access the funds, but that entities other than multilateral development banks can access the fund uh, through an accreditation process. So the accreditation of national and regional entities um, includes the potential for non-governmental organizations, several of which have been accredited, as well as women's funds, um, none of which have been accredited yet, um, but that could uh, implement projects and programs under the GCF. The GCF is the largest source of readiness funding. This is funding that's supporting a preparatory activities, um, the discovery and identification of priorities and key projects within countries, um, enabling uh, countries to prepare their, their climate plans and policies. Um, and an example of that is national adaptation plans. And then this is also linked to this idea that of the GCF is, is strongly connected with the UNFCCC and with Paris. And so it is directly supporting these policy and planning documents coming uh, that countries have to fulfill their Paris commitments. And the, the Conference of the Parties issues guidance directly to the Green Climate Fund Board um, for them to consider and as they are steering the GCF and how its billions of dollars are being spent and prioritized every year. Uh, all right, we just have five more elements we're going to talk about quickly, but the GCF is really important in terms of adaptation funding because it sets this idea of equivalent funding, 50-50 um, um, for, for mitigation and adaptation. And we know within the larger climate finance sphere, Unfortunately, adaptation is often only getting about a quarter of the funds um, overall. There's also a ring fencing of the funding specifically um, for, for key areas, um, and that is for African states, for least developed countries, and for small island developing states. And, and so this is really important as ensuring that if we have a bigger replenishment, that means that this percentage will also be stronger um, going directly uh, to these key countries. And the GCF is accessible to all developing country parties. Right now, over 140 parties um, have national designated authorities and could access funds from the GCF. Um, of course, since you heard about this webinar likely through the women and gender constituency, you have probably heard about the GCF gender policy. Um, it was the first multilateral climate fund to embed gender from its founding in its governance and governing document. Um, and we know that we want to continue pushing it to have the best practice, um, not only on paper or not only on history, but in practice for its gender policy, also has an indigenous people's policy that should be fully and robustly implemented. Um, and it should have continuing to have strong standards as it's um, improving its environmental and social safeguards. We also recognize the importance of having independent mechanisms, um, at independent units as part of the GCF, such as the independent redress mechanism. Lastly, as we are thinking about the larger potential of the GCF, the accreditation and reaccreditation process really could be leveraged um, for higher standards across all portfolios of projects, whether or not those projects are directly funded by the GCF, um, because many large uh, players, so all of the multilateral development banks, many key um, international entities are accredited to the GCF. And as part of that accreditation and reaccreditation process, 
um, they are having to show their ability to align with the gender policy, with the indigenous people's policy, with environmental and social safeguards. So we hope that it raises the bar on effective climate action. And then as part of the reaccreditation process, the potential there, which has not been realized, is that there should be a portfolio shift um, away from carbon intensive uh, projects and any projects that are contributing to rather than addressing climate change. So before I pass it off to Liana to talk about exactly how replenishment works, I do want to have a few cautions here. Um, TT will also be getting into this as we talk about the vision for the GC app. Even though we want to advocate for strong replenishment for all of those reasons, um, an implicit replenishment does not solve everything. It is not going to guarantee that funding will flow directly to the, the communities where it's most needed. It's not going to automatically ensure that the GCF is more gender responsive. Um, and it's not going to open new windows and mechanisms for direct access funding. We still have to advocate for all of that outside of the replenishment process, which is really about getting contributors to make their biggest pledges um, possible with 100% grants. So we have to have this strategy of matching our advocacy with replenishment, with our continued advocacy for the GCF we want to see. And so as we think about this broader system, I think about supporting the GCF being really necessary for supporting the types of processes and elements that we want to see in climate finance, but it's obviously just not going to be sufficient. This is not the transformation we're looking for. This is one piece of the puzzle. Um, so with that, I'm really excited to hand it over to Liana Shalatek, the Heinrich Boll Foundation, and another act, alternate active observer to the GCF uh, to talk about how replenishment has worked in the past and how it's going to work this time. Liana. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, the next slide, please. So um, actually, as the GCF enters into its replenishment, it's the third time around that it's, and it's a little bit confusing because it's the second replenishment, but it's the third time around that it's asking for money. The first time was during the initial resource mobilization that was in 2014, and that was collecting money actually that was spent during the years of 2015 to 2019. And as Tara mentioned, um, um, 2015 was actually the time uh, just a couple of weeks before uh, the Paris Agreement, um, the Paris COP, um, uh, when uh, the Green Climate Fund was fully operationalized, uh, meaning it, be, uh, it began funding um, uh, projects. And it uh, was able to fund projects because of the initial resource mobilization. During that initial resource mobilization, we saw 45 contributor countries, including uh, some regions, for example, in, in Belgium, uh, the regions of Bologna and Flanders have contributed money and one city, Paris, that gave money. What is really important, um, uh, and that has been often held up as efforts to widen the contributor base is that we had eight developing countries um, that pledged and several of them also committed financing share. And that's notable, of course, because uh, developed countries are supposed to take the lead in climate finance provision. Uh, what is also important and becomes important as we are looking at um, the first replenishment and expectation for the second replenishment is looking at the share um, of the funding received from countries of the European Union, which was at 44%, makes it very clear that the European Union countries, obviously, which are large, um, a large part of the historic uh, responsibility for, for, for polluting, also have to be a large contributor, uh, if not the largest contributor um, um, uh, overall collectively to the Green Climate Fund. In terms of the quantity, um, about 10 billion, 10.3 uh, billion were pledged. But, and this is very important, we actually only had 7.2 billion available for commitment. And that was premised on two big issues. One is that we saw an exchange rate loss. We lost about 1 billion because it's possible uh, for payment in, uh, the, in, in the replenishment in a number of currencies. And they are usually packed at the time or an in, in, in exchange rate is, uh, is set at the time of, uh, of the fletching conference. The second much larger one was that the United States 
which has pledged um, under the then Obama administration to contribute uh, 3 billion, only actually um, was able or was able to contribute 1 billion under the Obama administration. Obviously, then we had the Trump administration leaving the Paris Agreement. And so they were in default on 2 billion of their promised contribution. And just recently, as a matter of fact, just this week, the US paid 1 billion of the billion in arrears. But that means they are still 1 billion short. And it's a question or it's very questionable um, that that is going to be uh, paid out um, um, by the end um, of the year. In terms of the quality of the financial input received, and that's very important because obviously um, we want to actually see all of it ideally received as grants because grants give you the most flexibility. And only if you receive grants, you can um, basically hand out financing to recipient countries in France. If you receive loans, and in the initial resource mobilization period, we uh, got a small percentage, six percentage um, of loans by France and Canada, that means that money can only be provided to recipient countries and loans. Two important issues um, uh, that are um, making the GCF very different uh, from, for example, the resource mobilization that we see, and there is similarly um, efforts in, in the financial institutions, we have no earmarking. That means all the money gets into one pot and the GCF board decides what's happening with it. A contributor cannot say, okay, I'll give you money, but I want that money to go solely for private sector activities. And we do not have representation on the board of the Green Climate Fund according to voting shares or inputs, which we do have in the multilateral development banks where the contributors are shareholders and the vote and the, the, the influence is according to the shares. And, and this is also very important, the contributions or the encashment as it's called of the mobilized efforts are over a nine year period. That has led um, to difficulties in the past. Um, the next slide. So the first replenishment, which is actually the phase um, that ends now in 2023, the four, four years, happened in 2019. Uh, there we already saw that we had um, a reduction in the number of contributors because we only had 32 contributor countries and including only two developing countries uh, or developing countries under the UNFCCC, namely uh, South Korea and Indonesia and two regions. Um, half doubled their pledges, those were mostly countries in, in, in Europe, but the United States and Australia did not pledge. They set um, the first replenishment in 2019 out. We still managed to get roughly the 10 billion, and because they did a little bit of gimmicks and, and mathematics, namely giving credit for early payments, um, they were able to claim that they basically despite the US and Australia not pledging, um, uh, received uh, another 10 billion for, for the four year period of the GCF1, the first replenishment phase. But obviously that fell very much short of what the expectation and the ask of civil society at that point was, which was the hope or, or, or the push for actually not only a doubling of individual pledges, but a doubling of the overall amount. Uh, we still had the payments possible over the nine year encashment period. And we saw basically a repeat of the in initial resource mobilization uh, period, namely that France and Canada contributed their contribution partially as grants and partially as loans. Um, with the first re replenishment, we basically got into that process of establishing of a four year cycle. Um, and we also uh, basically put up um, an entire process in terms of um, designing the four-year replenishment period to align with a strategic plan. Um, what was very important is for the first uh, replenishment, the strategic plan was only approved after basically all the replenishment batches had been made. And this um, uh, developed countries um, that are the main contributors or uh, the almost exclusive contributors did not like because they obviously wanted to determine and kind of know 
what the programming vision, the programming priorities would be before they pledged money, um, which is obviously counter to a climate justice approach, um, where you actually um, uh, have the Green Climate Fund determine its priority independent of the responsibility of contributor countries to contribute. Um, we also had a replenishment trigger, namely that 30 months before the end of the GCF1, which means already in the middle of 2021, um, the replenishment was triggered as a process. And that was really important because it involved particularly a number of evaluation efforts, something called the forward-looking um, performance, uh, uh, basically a performance review by the GCF Independent Evaluation Unit that looked at what has been achieved over the last couple of years in order to actually um, apply lessons learned for, for the vision of the fund going forward. The next slide. So we are now um, in the second replenishment. As I said, it was formally kicked off um, already a little while ago. Um, this will cover um, the, the period, the funding period from January 1st, 2024 to December 31st, 20 of 27. So a solid four year period. Um, we are right now in the process of what is called several um, consultation meetings um, that are meetings of potential contributors with some representatives from the board facilitated by a facilitator um, that is meant to actually push uh, particularly developed countries to contribute. Um, the second consultation meeting is actually going on today and tomorrow. We have representation uh, as civil society through our active observers there. This is very important, something that we have pushed for. Um, and that um, uh, also increases some of the transparency of what is happening in those consultations. And the biggest issue that they're gonna discuss this uh, today and tomorrow is pro progress on the GCF policy of contributions, where a couple of issues are, are still um, uh, outstanding. Um, uh, we hopefully um, and uh, are expected to continue with the issue of no earmarking, but some of the open issues is the question of whether there is an expected minimum contribution. There is an argument to basically say no contribution is too small. And in the past, we had really, really tiny contributions. This is obviously also part of the political impetus to um, widen the contributor base, particularly to allow, quote unquote, developing countries or other actors to come in. Um, the question, question is also whether we are still allowing for the encashment over nine years, uh, which has been problematic because sometimes that money is not delivered so that um, the Green Climate Fund has what it's called commitment authority, namely the ability to make funding decisions because commitment authority can only be made against the money that they basically have in their account. And if some of the money is not paid in according to the, uh, to, to the schedule, this is very difficult. And the question is whether the cap for loans, which is currently at 20%, um, is actually going to be maintained. We have not used the 20% in the past. Again, for the last two periods, it was 6%. However, there is a push for expanding the use of loans. And again, if you get loans as input, you have to get give loans out at output. So in order to actually safeguard uh, the priority grant financing that we want to see, particularly for adaptation, we need to fight in the replenishment to have as many grants as possible and uh, if possible, exclusively grants. Um, two other things are very important. Um, the independent evaluation unit did uh, its second performance review which was um, presented at the last board meeting at B34. Uh, and we show you later on if you are interested where you can read up on it. It's a lengthy document. We also summarize it quickly. Um, we will at the next board meeting, which is coming up in July, um, uh, finalize the strategic plan. Again, this is a core opportunity for civil society and for feminists to engage in trying to help shape the strategic vision and the priorities for the next four years. 
And then the pledging conference where most, but hopefully not all of the pledges over the course of the replenishment, second replenishment period will happen, um, will be on October 5th in Bonn. And again, the active observers are able um, to attend and represent civil society there and hopefully also with strong statement. Next slide. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, first is on, um, or unanswered questions or expectation. First is on the ambition of the second replenishment. So um, in, in, in statements that um, civil society has elaborated, um, and uh, particularly the GCF Observer Network, um, but uh, that we are also asking, obviously, in terms of the advocacy of all of you to support and engaging with your respective um, governments, particularly in developed countries, is for CSU to ask for at least the doubling of the GCF on one commitment. Now, we have to um, say that why we have to push for it, um, it's not quite sure that that is really realistic. There are a number of open questions. One, and the most um, important ones, will the United States and Australia and others come back that have set out um, the first replenishment? The question will also be what the strengths of the EU contributions is and whether there will be other contributors and particularly they are eyeing the possibility of philanthropic contributors uh, computers. It will also be a sign how many developing countries will pledge some funding. And this obviously goes also back to the larger uh, discourse and the broader signaling um, that we have in other ongoing processes at the moment, namely the NCQG, the new collective quantified goal on, on climate finance, where they are likewise talking about widening the contributor base and also the, the new loss and damage fund that is currently in the design phase and in the discussion phase where the same argumentation has to be made. When we are looking at the advocacy timeline, key moments are um, obviously the upcoming intercessionals in Bonn, the regional climate weeks, um, the Climate Ambition Summit in September um, that will be hosted by the UN Secretary General. And then um, it's important, although it's post um, the pledging conference in early October COP28, because um, as Tara has mentioned, ongoing pledging is possible throughout the replenishment period. And while in the past, not much additional pledging has happened outside of, of the pledging conference itself, it does not mean that that shouldn't happen during the second replenishment. And as a matter of fact, and particularly if there are other countries that are setting out the second replenishment, uh, the pledging conference for the second replenishment, we should strongly push for that. Next one. Um, really quickly, and I think we are running out of time, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time on that. Um, a second performance review, as I said, was very important because it gives recommendation for the GCF improvement over the GCF2 programming one. A couple um, of core findings, it points out that the GCF has uh, matured, but also points out a number of shortcomings, many of which civil society have also um, identified, including that we need a better results framework and have to focus more on impacts and get away from a culture um, that is currently focused on, on sometimes just getting money out, no matter how. Um, we need more focus on supporting direct access entities and increasing direct access. And we need a new understanding and revision of what is called the risk appetite, the willingness of the GCF and the GCF board to take risk, where it's um, you know, more willing to take risk with some, particularly the private sector, and less risk with other. And that includes, um, unfortunately, some of the small scale locally led um, uh, activities that are happening on the ground. Very important is that the second performance review pushed uh, for and pointed out the need to revisit the observer function, the way how observers, how civil society, how feminists engage with the board. Uh, namely that we need better observer participation guidelines, that there needs to be more systematic input 
end, and this is a really important that developing country CSO active observers are actually um, um, getting financial support in order um, to, to uh, be able to represent civil society from the global south in those meetings. Next slide. I'm not going into the updated strategic plan other than to say that again, um, it is to be approved at the next board meeting. That means in July, that means the next couple of months are really, really crucial for us to push for some of the improvements of what we have seen in drafts, uh, which very scarily prioritizes in scope and scale private sector finance without adding accountability or transparency and uh, continue some of the overall problems that we see in climate finance, that actually financial inno innovation um, and financialization is seen as a result or impact in and of itself instead of just considered a tool. And so that bankability is considered more important as lasting impacts and behavioral change. And so what is really important is that we within the next couple of months do a strong parallel advocacy push for both the best replenishment and the best possible um, updated strategic plan. Next slide. So what is what can you do to support a strong replenishment? Um, obviously, it's important that we talk about that the replenishment is happening. Unfortunately, in the discourse with so much um, of the energy and the excitement um, in climate finance uh, focused on the loss and damage fund, which is really important. There is um, not much attention being paid to the fact that the Green Climate Fund remains really important, both as a signal giver uh, for the overall ambition of climate finance provision, but obviously as a way to support developing countries. Um, so we need um, expectation for strong and ambitious replenishment. We also need to get away from basically saying how ineffective or slow the GCF is, because this only helps to push more of climate finance into the MDB context, which on so many levels in a climate justice perspective is not the right vehicles, including because they provide so much more of their climate finance uh, in terms of loans. Um, and also important to share resources as campaigning begins. Um, and we show you in the next slide, um, a couple of the resources, um, um, particularly from the GCF Observer Network, uh, where we will be sharing the video of the replenishment intervention, um, long statements in several languages on why the replenishment really is important and likewise a shorter statement. And it shows here a couple of, and again, the slides will be shared after uh, the webinar. Um, it shows a couple of the resources if you wanna read up on the progress of what the GCF has accomplished over the past four years on um, replenishment overall, the technical process, and on the second performance review. Thank you. Thanks so much, Liana. We're actually going to skip this next uh, question on due to time, but I, I'm still really interested in everyone's responses to it, so we'll send it out when we send out the recording in the session. Um, I want to introduce for our last section before our, our question and answers, uh, Titi Akasa. She's the executive director of the Center for 21st Century Issues in Nigeria. Um, like Liana and myself, she is an alternate active observer um, for GCF. Um, and, and she also coordinates uh, a group of regional gender monitors um, that are working throughout Africa. To, to encourage and promote greater gender responsive um, preparation of, of projects as well as implementation of projects through the GCF. So TT, um, can you share some more about the vision we have for the GCF and what we're advocating for? It looks like TT had just dropped off. Um, TT, um, are you able to come back in now and talk about your vision for the GCF? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead.
while we wait for TT to get her connectivity oh, back. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm happy to be here with all of you. And once again, my name is Titi Akosa. I'm the Executive Director of Center for 21st Century Issues. You have really listened to all my colleagues, giving you the broader picture. And then Tara telling you about what the GCF is really all about and part of the replenishment, what we are thinking around the replenishment. And then we've heard from Liana, uh, history around the replenishment up to the, uh, the second replenishment that we are on now. And now, what is our vision as civil society and as feminists? Uh, why are we engaging? We need to understand why we need to engage. And I want to really remind you about what Tara said, that uh, the fact that we are not going to have a replenishment doesn't mean that the money may eventually fail. But at the same time, we must also think deeply if we have a flagship uh, climate finance institution that is whose mandate is to support developing countries or also implement their indices, don't you think it's also very important that uh, the replenishment be very become, become an important uh, uh, issue that we as feminists need to engage? Looking at the fact that most of the time we complain that this some of this funding don't flow to us. But we have a GCF that has been able also to initiate some important processes that, uh, that is ongoing. I will not say that these processes are perfect in, in all, but we can say that it holds promises for us as civil society and particularly as feminists to realize uh, climate finance on the ground for women, indigenous groups, local communities, and all stakeholders. And more especially for a lot of us who are in the developing world who have not contributed to the impact uh, of climate change, but we are suffering the heaviest burdens of it. So I'm going to tell you our vision, and you have seen on the, on the uh, platform now, we need a fund that responds swiftly to climate finance. And I, I can hear that from a lot of us, especially at the last COP28, where I see a lot of people really pushing for us. And one of the important things we keep a kind of fund that we can really say it's ours and can really deal with some of the issues we are having on the ground. So this is also very true also for GCF, not only for the loss and damage that we're championing now. And I know that uh, since 2015 till now, there are a lot of things that have happened in the GCF. For instance, we've had a GCF that has a gender policy and a gender action plan. And I must say of all the climate finance institutions, and uh, that started out before the GCF. None of them was thinking around gender policy and gender action plan. But with the constant engagement of civil society and more particularly feminists who are in the mix, they continue to agitate and advocate for a true gender mainstreaming, not only true gender mainstreaming, but a gender action plan, not only at the fund level or uh, the GCF fund level secretariat, but also at project level. And today we've been able to establish this. And I know that all other climate finance institutions have also come to GCF to do. And one important thing that this has really signaled to us is that no matter what project proposals that is being put on the table of the GCF, it means that at least there should be some funding allocated for gender mainstreaming in those projects. Whether it is done or not, it's a different thing entirely. But at least that is the starting point for us. And we as uh, feminists continue to engage the process at the local level. And that is also to our stakeholders consultation. As much as we as civil society observers at the uh, GCF level uh, secretariat, we have active observers who continue to engage on behalf of the people on the ground. We also are, uh, we continue to deepen stakeholders consultations on the ground. For instance, Center for 24 Cent, we have been able also to work with uh, uh, the uh, as, uh, affected entities at the African level and at the national level. And we have our gender monitors who are also doing the same. 
these are these opportunities have been opened up to the GCS, and this was not so before. So if we if we continue to push in our uh, interest and continue to tell the, uh, the GCF what the people need and continue to put the voices of the people on the table, I'm sure we will actually get to this, uh, our vision that we have for GCF. We can also talk about the country ownership also. These are some of the important protests. Country ownership means that whatever project or anything that you have, that's the simple way I can interpret it, that you, the people, own those projects. It is your country ownership. It is part of your NDC. It is what you really wish. It is some of the things you think to address, uh, how you want to respond to the impacts of climate change in your country. And this is a very important process also for anybody who is engaged with the GCF. And that's why the issue of replenishment is also very important for us, because when we continue to have replenishment and we have more funds in the GCF, it will continue, it help us to deepen our engagement with all these processes. And at the end of the day, our journey towards ensuring that funds flow to the local level and for a locally led adaptation of course, it gets to the answer of those who actually need it the most. Also, we've talked about direct access. I know Tara spoke about direct access. This is one of the important advantage that GCF yeah, promises for a whole lot of developing countries. We don't need financial intermediaries. We can also be able to, of course, bolster up our, our capacity at the country level to assess this funds directly from GCF rather than going through a um, multilateral development banks that are accredited entities to the GCF, it is up to us to also engage with this uh, system, build up the capacity of our countries to absorb a lot of uh, finance from the GCF. And then we have uh, what I call the readiness program. The readiness program. And uh, the readiness program, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a program that helps uh, countries also to build up on what uh, the kind of projects that they want to engage with the GCF. It helps them to put together their uh, proposals, their, uh, their proposals that they will put before the GCF entities also. So these are important uh, processes that countries from the developing world can really engage. And then finally, we are talking about voice and accountability, and that is very, very important. As much as we have a lot of money coming in through the replenishment, who do we hold accountable? And whose voice counts here? And whose voice counts here? The voice of the beneficiaries are really, really important to tell their stories of how GCF funding has impacted their how it has gone to them how they have resources, more resources to address the impacts of climate change. And then let us continue to, how do we ensure that device voices continue to engage with the civil society, uh, with the GCF process? These are very, very important issues. So engage with this because it's all that promises for us to be able to ensure that money actually flows to those who actually need it. I know it's a lot, it's, it, could, it will sound as if it's a long journey, but I think it is not anymore because as civil society, we have really done a lot to ensure that this funds actually gets to the answer of those who need it the most. Yet it may not have been perfect as it were today, but it is still a process on course. And I'm sure that we will we'll get our vision Thank you very much. Thank you so much, TT. Um, I really appreciate having such a robust vision. And I know that we have so many people that have engaged in advocacy on the GCF here, as well as many of you that are new to the GCF and this type of advocacy. We welcome questions from all of you. Um, you can raise your hand and I can call on you or you can put a question in the chat. While we're waiting, oh, great. While we've got a, our first question, um, 
Fabia, we'd love to hear from you. Um, yeah, thanks, Tara. Uh, it, it was quite an informative session. And it's the first time, I mean, like, I'm understanding a lot of details about GCF. Um, so my question is, I mean, like, it's not specified to any of the particular speaker, but it's in general. Um, so especially when we talk about the Green Climate Fund, I understand it, it comes for, like, at the country level, one single uh, kind of, like, a coordinator. Uh, and for India, it is, like, the NABAD, which is a huge... Um, bank system that we have in India. So then when we are talking about the direct access, especially if we have to like reach it to the uh, ground, to the field players, how do we like work towards it, especially on the advocacy angle? So the GCF uh, coordination mechanism works through national designated authorities. And these are usually ministries or departments uh, within the government maybe a Ministry of Finance, maybe a Ministry of the Environment. And they are the key liaisons with the GCF. So they, uh, that flows directly to local communities. There are some things that we want to do to advocate for more of that happening directly within the GCF. Um, and we'd be happy to engage with you more on that. And there are groups that are specifically looking um, at the gender responsiveness of projects. Um, as they're brought forth to the board by these various entities and engaging with those entities as necessary. So I hope that starts to answer your question, but it is a question that we could honestly spend hours on about these dynamics. Um, and I would welcome if Liana or Titi wants to come in further on that. Uh, Thanks, just maybe Tara. quickly, Bavia, since since you mentioned the, the, the question of engagement, um, I think it's it's really important uh, for, for civil society and particularly feminist civil society to reach out um, to, for example, the NDA, so the National Designated Authority, uh, because they are actually supposed to reach out to stakeholders and coordinate with stakeholders. We know that that's not happening uh, to the extent that it's supposed to. But it's likewise important um, to reach out uh, for to a, 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 a direct access entity in the country like uh, like NABARD. Um, and as you pointed out, NABARD is obviously a very huge entity and is um, having banking and financial intermediary capacities. But that doesn't mean that, for example, in projects or programs that they bring forward to the Green Climate Funds, they can integrate in their projects or programs um, elements like, for example, small grant approaches that actually bring financing more concretely uh, to communities on the ground. And this is obviously in addition to some of the direct advocacy for, for, for enhancing more direct access for those groups um, that we are continuing doing, um, but it's a way to make sure that direct access entities are aware of their responsibility to work with and on behalf of communities as well. Thank you so much. I see some other questions um, similarly in the chat that are more about how the GCF functions. And I would urge those of you with those sorts of questions um, to follow up with those of us that are engaged with the, the the GCF Observer Network of Civil Society, Indigenous Peoples, and Local Communities directly. And I will have a slide with all of our email addresses and we'll put them in the chat as well. But would love to focus more on questions concerning um, how, how you're understanding these narratives of the GCF and the replenishment process. Um, Pruth, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, thank you so much and thank you uh for the beautiful presentations and i'm happy to really learn more about the uh, gcf funding um my question is more or less related to to the last speaker because um of course civil society we do not like cannot directly uh, apply for this fund which actually is a bit unfortunate uh, because, for instance, in Uganda, I think the accredited um, organizations are like three. And at the end of the day, when they get this money, we even sometimes never get to know that this money has reached to them. So my thinking is, is there a way we can probably 
uh, put across, I don't know if it is a condition on, on, on or advocate for it that have maybe uh, co-implementation, those government entities that are implementing, for instance, to, 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 to implement with civil society organizations. I know there are some proposals, there are some projects. Uh, I mean, I work with NAPE, National Association of Professional Environmentalists, I know there are some projects that we have worked on with NEMA, the National Environmental Management Authority here in Uganda. There are some projects that we have implemented together, but there is that strict clause that this project will only be allowed or the funding will only be allowed if there is a civil society uh, group on board to implement. And they reach out to different civil society organizations to apply, or sometimes they already know who is doing what and who is best fit uh, according to, to a specific area maybe uh, that they call is, 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 is about. So that is my thinking, because otherwise, even when we are advocating for, for, for the money, we are advocating, I mean, when you're looking at the vision, it may, we may not achieve it if it is just a few accredited uh, ed entities that will receive money on, on behalf of us. That's my thinking. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's incredibly true that we have to have an advocacy strategy that is both focused on greater amounts of replenishment and advocacy for greater direct access, um, greater true and meaningful consultation and engagement of civil society, um, and more enhanced direct access, which is a potential mechanism that could have funding flowing to the local levels. And that's not directly facilitated very much at all by the GCF right now. Um, just being mindful of time, Sasha, we'd love to hear your question or comment. Hi, yes, thanks so much uh, for these great presentations. Uh, I have three questions. The first one is, um, so, um, those who are giving the money cannot earmark the money, and it's up to the board to decide. But we see that at the moment, even with the readiness funding, which we had, had hoped would also help to do more um, or give more financing for like uh, gender climate focal points to really prepare gender responsive climate programs to the GCF, that that is not happening. So can we or should we push the board for specific allocations for gender activities? Um, specific, so, so that they would earmark funding as the board, since the, those who are giving the money can't earmark. One question. The second question is you talked about the accredited intermediaries who could um, receive the funding, and you said currently no feminist organizations or women's funds are accredited as intermediaries. Uh, do we have a strategy for that? And should, do we need it? Is this something to discuss? And when has anybody tried <laughs> ever? And um, you talked about the board meeting in Bonn upcoming, and you said uh, those who are accredited can participate. I think several of us here are accredited, but we're maybe not planning to go. Would that be strategic? And what is the strategy around that? Thanks. Thanks, Sasha. I'm going to pass your first question quickly to Liana, and then. Um, on, on your second question, there have been at least two women's funds that I know of that have considered um, accreditation but have not actually applied for accreditation once looking at um, how complex that process might be. But there is some other consideration I'm happy to talk with you about on strategies for getting a women's fund accredited. Um, and then on the board meeting, uh, not necessarily um, is this board meeting going to be very different from others? Um, because we're thinking about what sort of replenishment advocacy that we want to do that is not just internal to the GCF and the folks that are already at the meeting, but external and can really put pressure. But Liana, I, I know you want to come in on that first question. Yeah, thank you, Sasha. It's a it's a really good question. Um, it's also a little bit complicated. So um, uh, the the board um, only provides the overall funding envelope for the readiness program within that funding envelope and can cannot earmark. The board does not earmark within within the readiness funding. Um, the readiness funding decisions are then made by the secretariat based on requests by the national designated authorities. So if you actually want money 
um, to go uh, directly um, to gender activities, gender focal point. Then the issue is advocacy with national designated authorities because they have to request that they want money for those kind of activities under the readiness finance that they are requesting from the GCF. It's completely possible. I want to point that out because actually uh, this is part of the country ownership and the strengthening of, of um, you know, the procedures and processes that can be supported um, by, by readiness financing. But again, the big sticker here is that it needs to be requested by the country. The country decides what it wants readiness financing for. Um, so on that, and then giving it back to Tara for the other questions. Thanks so yeah, much. Sure. Happy to Can take I just it. weigh in? Can I weigh in on yeah, some of those? Yeah, of course. Things? Come in, Titi. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think the the last but one question was asking how they could assess funds as civil society. There is opportunity for civil society to assess GCF funds through their NDAs, and uh, it could be through the readiness process. I can give an example of what a civil society in Ghana has done. They've been able to assess it up to four hundred thousand. Is four hundred thousand dollars for CSO readiness in Ghana, and it's not, and it, it, it's a civil society based in Ghana, and they've not even been part of the CSO observers network. But the way they worked closely with their NDA to be able to assess that. So that I would also tell some of my colleagues here who are from African countries, you have your GCF monitors in your country. I think the last person that spoke, we have a GCF monitor in Uganda who is currently engaging with their NDA. You can team up with that person, engage with your NDA. You can, just like Taliana said, you can, your NDA can ask request for the readiness uh, finance to actually do a lot with mobilizing civil society, local communities, and then getting their valuable inputs into projects and programs that they want to send to the GCF. And that is really how you can start having access. But for, uh, uh, for, direct, uh, for accredited entities, I think Leanne has shared the link in the chat. Look at all the different accredited entities on that uh, list. Look at the ones that are also implementing projects in your country. You may not even only join them in implementing a project, but you could also be someone who monitors what the project is uh, doing on the ground and be able to raise some important voices if things are going wrong. So there are different ways in which we can participate and benefit from the GCF fund. So I think these are some of the things I really wanted to put on the table. Thank you. Thank you so much, TT, for sharing that. I'm going to go ahead um, and, and share some of our final screens as I ask Nisha to come on and ask her question, just so that we have this reminder of the resources and recordings and um, a reminder about how to engage with the, the GCF CSO Observer Network, where you can get a lot of these questions about how the GCF does and does not function um, better answered. Nisha, uh, would love to hear your question or comment. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Sarah. And uh, I'll try to be quick. I know we're running out of time. Uh, a few things. I mean, uh, Wokan, as you know, we've been you know uh, observing <laughs> from far away. But uh, something that we've been realizing, like you know, working in the local level as well, is uh, I, I think something uh, maybe Leanne or Sasha just mentioned as well is that ultimately, you know, even if it's replenishment or whatever it is, it has to come from the country level. And I feel like like our women's group uh, advocacy engagement has been like, you know, it's, it's everyone who has an idea of what's happening with GCF, right? who's interested, right? So I, I remember there was one time when there was like certain proposals would come from specific countries, there will be an actual email that goes into the women's major group saying, you know, this proposal is coming up. If anybody's working in that country, like, you know, review it, you know, all that stuff. So I feel like that kind of engagement is so critical, even like maybe like, you know, in the uh, countries where the, you know, in, I don't know, USA and Australia, if we have uh, colleagues from those countries, like, you know, letting them know that this is what's happening and, you know, that needs to be advocated in level as well. And I don't know if that is, uh, you know, how that is happening. So. Sometimes I feel like, you know, uh, we're talking with the same group of people and then 
maybe and then when when we go to the country and we actually try to engage with some of the local uh women's groups and even like you know women uh corporate line groups who are actually working on environment they'll be like oh no no, no. like you know it's um we don't know what's going on like we don't know how to engage and like if you can say like you know you can contact these designated authorities they'll be like it's not easy it's not getting easy to access those designated authority for the women's groups right because they're already so marginalized uh, within the country and now it's talking about finance there are always a lot of political uh you know barriers when the moment finance is there right so and then i mean the ministries itself are are fighting <laughs> who's gonna lead that um you know lead the gcf project right so it's there's a lot of these uh Issues. So I was like, you know, maybe uh, for our group itself, if we can think of local level advocacy, and maybe we need to think like regionally, like, you know, maybe every country going to be difficult, right? But if at least we can think in a regional space, and then having those voices and making sure somebody representing that group is in the observer, observer status, you know, I feel like that way that we can like, you know, mobilize a little bit more effectively, that is a possibility. Uh, because, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, lots, lots of stuff happening. And I mean, as the topic says of this, you know, webinar today is like, you know, it is so important for us to be engaged, but sometimes it feels like, how, you know, <laughs> like, who is engaging and like, now how can we mobilize? Sometimes it's just a bit overwhelming for, you know, and then, of course, you know, as we all know, uh, small women's organizations, we don't have funds to dedicate one individual to follow up right so like you know are there resources for uh you know uh for advocacy groups and other groups to be able to maybe we need to think about that you know in the space i don't i don't know if it's through gcf or like you know other funds uh, but it is so critical because there's a lot of um, miscommunication and lack of information uh and a little bit overwhelming information for some uh in every level so just wanted to share that with everybody and thank you Thank you so much, Nisha, for sharing those experiences and those perspectives. And I will say, indeed, it does feel like there are several different civil society groups um, that are following more closely what's happening on the ground. And a lot of that's being organized through GCF Watch. And I would particularly point out the GCF Watch um, regional node for Latin America, who's currently trying to survey and understand all of the different monitoring and implementation that may be happening at more local levels with these projects. So I think that's a really good note and a conversation we do need to continue taking forward and finding real resources for. Um, so we are at the conclusion of our our session today. We're a few minutes over time. I am still interested, though, if anyone does have another moment um, to stay um, to, to answer this particular poll. Um, otherwise, we will be sharing information out to everyone who registered and thanking everyone for their time. Um, we, we appreciate all your engagement. We realize that the GCF is a rich and complex topic and that there are a lot of questions, not only about replenishment, but how it works and how we can continue to engage as feminists. And we'll continue to try and address those through the women and gender constituency as best we can. Um, so you can follow GCF Watch on Twitter for the latest on what's happening with replenishment. Did that poll actually launch? Um, yes, it did, wonderful. I am going to close it in 10 more seconds so that y'all can see the results. So go ahead and click on something. You can click on more than one answer of how you might be best support, poised to support replenishment or not, because we don't always have capacity. And maybe what you've learned is that this is not the right space for your organization today. And we're still really happy if you learned enough about the GCF to be able to identify that. So I'm going to end the poll in three more seconds. And y'all can see here um, that the majority of you are going to be able to integrate something that you've learned here um, into your communications, um, which I think is really wonderful as we're thinking about this outward facing um, communication on the GCF. I want to thank you to uh, Liana and to Titi and to Amelia for helping provide so much context today on the GCF and continuing to be um, sources of um, information. And you can see um, some emails here listed in order of who has the most complicated email. Um, and thank you so much to our interpretation team that made this, uh, this session more accessible to everyone. Uh, thank you so much. And I hope you have a good rest of your day and we'll all be in touch.
Can I just come in and say really quickly a big thank you to Tara who conceived of that webinar and did the bulk of the work to get it off the ground and running and usually goes thankless for the tasks that she does and for the leadership she provides. So thank you very much to Tara. Yeah, for that. so much. Thank you Yay, so much, Tara, you, Tara, for all your hard work. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your day. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Be in touch.